right, so we're another beautiful, cold, crisp day in Northwest Florida. We're in the book of Romans. We'll finish it today, chapter 14. And just as a reminder, the first 12 verses here in chapter 14 deal with freedom, how we're made free in Christ. It speaks about this whole thing of not judging one another and the fact that we belong to God. And there's a great central verse, I think, there in chapter 14. I'll just read it for you. It's verse 4, and it says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Don't be so quick to criticize or judge when someone stumbles or falls. God is, God is able to make him stand, to make her stand. And we're all different. We're all free in Christ if you're a believer. Free to, as the debate is going on here between the Gentile and Jewish Christians in Rome, we're free to eat meat or to not. We're free to be gluten eaters. What is, I don't know, I'm not sure I know what gluten is, but I like it. I like gluten. <laughs> oh, you don't have to eat gluten. That's fine, too. We're free to be a vegan or someone who's into the whole keto thing, the, the, the carnivores, the meat eaters. You know, the, the creativity and variety that God has formed is amazing in people. They come in all sizes, they come in all shapes, they come in all colors. We're speaking to people that come in all kinds, but they're all different. You ever think about that? I mean, it's interesting to me that God can take a face and he can put a nose, a mouth, a chin, some ears, some eyes, and everybody for the most part has them, but we all look different. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you, 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 all, you don't have to look around, but everyone is different even though they have the same parts for the most part. And that's kind of mind-blowing in some ways. You're like a, God has like these human <laughs> potato heads and he just puts them together <laughs> uh, however he wants to do it. We all have fingers for the most part, but everybody has a totally unique, different fingerprint. Even our palms have, have a different design on them, although we all have them. We all have different backgrounds. Emotionally, we're different. I mean, I can tell someone a joke, and they'll laugh like crazy. Someone standing right next to them, hmm. Yeah. So, so, so people are different. You can be living here in northwest Florida, and, you know, there's this thing called the pal palmetto bug. That's the kind name for it. It's a cockroach. And one can fly into your, some of them fly. One can come into your room and hit the wall, and you can process it one way, and your wife can process it a whole different way. Mine does. My wife is from the Northeast, I don't know, maybe they don't have bugs there, but she processes bugs differently than I do, and I've had to learn that over the years. There'll be a dead roach or a bug or something, I'll come home and it'll be under a cup. I go, what's that cup in the bathroom for? Oh, there's a roach under there. Really? Or she's a real early riser. I mean, we have pest control, we, we spray, we try to kill the dog that way, but there's, we have pest control, and... They'll come and they'll spray the house and, you know, next morning I'll wake up. She's been up for several hours. She said, there's a dead uh, roach in there by the shower. Now, I used to when we first got married. I said, well, why don't you pick it up? Now, I just very humbly and meekly, I go in there and I pick it up and I get rid of it because she processes things a lot differently than I do. We're different. Everybody's different. It tells us here as we, as we uh, look at the scripture that, that the body of Christ is all different. But yet we're called to be one in Christ. 
We're called to love one another, to not judge one another. This verse here in chapter 14, I want to start off with uh, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Now, what a great verse to, to memorize and to put in action in your life. Let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. You wake up in the morning, okay, I'm not going to judge anybody today. I'm going to resolve to do this, to not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother or sister's way. That's how I'm going to walk out the day. Be free, be different, but don't judge. And love, as we see, is the trump card for all this. It's it's the overriding value. it's, It's more important than freedom or liberty. So we don't make anyone fall or stumble. See the scripture, and you will see this as we go through the rest of this chapter, the weaker or the immature believer is the one more interested in their liberty, in their freedom, than the other person. Oh, I'm going to do it my way. More interested in their rights. Caring more about their freedom than than love. And there's that balance that Paul calls us to, that he, he wants us to see. In fact, in another book, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he says... Stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Don't be entangled again. Don't go back to the old life he set you free. Don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But then he goes on to say this. For you have been called to liberty. You've been called to freedom. But don't use it as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. And that's what he begins to talk about here as well in Romans chapter 14. Not a legalistic lifestyle. Living by someone's rules, their do's and don'ts. You know, having this attitude that, well, I don't do this and I don't go there. And I'm not involved in that, so I'm more spiritual than you are. And you shouldn't do that. My convictions, the way I live, more pleasing to God than yours. And and Paul begins to deal with that. Once again, that, that, that great verse, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Call to freedom but also called to love one another. Not everyone is mature. We, we all have a starting point. So, so discernment and wisdom and especially love as we walk out this thing called our Christianity. I would say it like this. Hey, have a heart for people. Slow down. Don't offend. Don't stumble people. Watch out what you're doing. You use the brakes once in a while. Use self-control. Here's what he says. He says in verse 14, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. In other words, you might be free in your conscience and in Scripture to participate and be involved in certain things, but not everybody is. Some people have hang-ups. Some people have pasts that they've come out of and things they're dealing with that you're completely free to be involved in. We have some friends that, well, they come out of a background of witchcraft and occult, and they'll have nothing to do with Halloween. You might be free. But I certainly wouldn't put them in a situation where they were impacted by something I was free to do because it it creates great uneasiness for them. Some people grew up in homes where their parents were alcoholics and they themselves have addictive personalities. 
So I wouldn't have them in my home and have a bunch of alcohol sitting around or, or say, hey, let's meet at such and such place. Nor would I post things on social media that might cause them to stumble or be impacted by it. Nothing's unclean in itself. Now, the context here certainly isn't saying there's nothing sinful in itself. Certainly, there are things that are sinful. The debate that's raging here is between meat offered to idols and holy days and feasts and festivals, Jew versus Gentile background. And when he says nothing is unclean of itself, it doesn't mean there's nothing sinful. Certainly, stealing is sinful. Sex outside of marriage, that context, well, the Bible says it's sinful. Drunkenness from beginning to end in the Scripture is seen as sinful and wrong. This is a debate about foods and festivals and meat offerings. And if it's wrong for you, he says it's wrong. Look at verse 15 as he begins talking. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died for. And he's talking about love. He says, but both of you are loved by God. So love one another. Don't use your freedom to damage another's faith. In verse 16, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Don't flaunt, is what he's saying, your liberty. It becomes an offense for someone, and out of love, use self-control. As these Jews and Gentiles are coming together, and some are more mature, and some are, some are you know, infants in their faith, he's saying, look, you've got you to gotta care for the weaker ones. You can't just do whatever you want to do. It, it, it stumbles them. I want to put a picture up here of a famous athlete. Some of you recognize this guy. Who, who is he? Muhammad Ali. Now, Muhammad Ali was a very humble, gentle kind of guy, not very braggadocious. He had something he would always say about himself. What was that? Besides that, besides float like a butterfly, I am the greatest, the greatest there ever has been. That was Muhammad's big deal. And one time he was flying somewhere after a fight and he had won and, you know, he had his entourage and he's sitting up in first class. And one of the flight attendants came to him and said, sir, you need to buckle your seatbelt. He just kind of smiled. And then it got time for the plane to leave the runway and they sent another flight attendant that said, sir, you need to buckle your seatbelt. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the flight attendant very quickly and wisely said, Superman don't need no plane. <laughs> Buckle up. And to that I say, sometimes we limit our freedom even though we may be strong. We buckle up. Flaunting of things that are offensive are wrong. If you need to buckle up, Buckle up. We don't need to know how strong you are. That's what Paul is saying. Limit your freedom for others. People need to know how much you love them, not how free you are. In Proverbs chapter 18, there's a great verse that says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. You ever tried to win someone back that's been offended? I've had situations in this church and over the years where someone will say, you know, you call, hey, I haven't seen you around. Oh, I'm not coming back to that church. Why? What's up? Oh, so-and-so said something about my blouse or so-and-so said something about the way I dress or so-and-so said something about this. And I go, really? And they're harder to win than a strong city. You put them in a, you put them in a prison be careful. Your, your views and your values, your list, your, your whatever. Out of love for others, have a heart of love. Don't be quick to criticize. In verse 17, for, for the kingdom of God, and this is a great, powerful verse. 
Please listen to it. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, this, this debate was all about eating and drinking and, and, and external things. And, and the point that Paul is making is, is this is about deeper things, the, our faith, our, our walk, the body of Christ. It, it's about the heart. It's about intangible things like peace and joy and love in the Holy Spirit. This is the essence of Christianity. It's not external. It's eternal. It's not about appearances or habits or clothes or holidays, those obvious things you can see with your eyes. But real life is not about external or fleshly, but it's about our hearts. It's about the Spirit. What you and I will answer for is not so much what we put into our stomach, but the attitude of our hearts toward other people, towards the Lord. That's what he's saying. And and so he was reminding us, for he who serves Christ in these things, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, is acceptable both to God and man. He says, God pleased with both of those now. Now that you, you, you walk in the Spirit and it's not all about the externals. Not about eating and drinking. And then he goes on to say another powerful verse. And this, this last part of chapter 14 just has some that kind of should jump out at us and should be some themes of our life. In verse 19, therefore, this is a great, let us pursue the things which make for peace. And the things by which one may edify another. Kind of wake up in the morning and go, okay, Lord, let me pursue those things that make for peace. And let me be somebody who edifies other people and not constantly criticize or tears them down. Those who are weak, those who are strong. I mean, this is the, that, that principle that, that runs through all of Christianity. Lord, today, help me not to tear others down. Or offend someone, but, but let your love shine through me. Those who have their, you know, checklist, they're checking everybody off, how they dress, what they look like, how they wear their hair, their clothes, are they pierced, are they tatted, you know, they got their little grid and they've got to fit inside of yours. I like the story is told about a, a, a pastor of time gone by. His name was uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse. This is back in the 1920s. And he was, he, was, he was teaching at a youth conference. And, of course, there was older people leading. And uh, it was both men and women. And, and one of the ladies came up to him. Because some of the girls, she said, were not wearing stockings. And she wanted Barnhouse to rebuke him. And this is an interesting thing because sometimes people will come to you as a pastor or a leader and kind of ask you to rebuke on the side people they want to rebuke. It's a weird thing. And you're like, I'm not sure. I'm a... So he, he looked him in the eye and he responded about this, this thing about girls not wearing stockings. And he, he, they, they were appalled by it. And he said, the Virgin Mary never wore stockings. And they were like, really? He said, no, the first people to wear stockings were prostitutes in Italy in the 15th century. <laughs> he said, and one day a, a, a woman in a, in a nobility wore some to a court ball at the aghast of everybody. And then soon after that, it became very prominent, he said, but that was the Victorian age. People have all kinds of rules and codes He's talking here about the Gentile and the Jewish problem, the festivals, the holidays, meat offered to idols. He says, nothing unclean about meat or dates or feasts or festivals. And Paul is reminding us and them about balance and control, about living by rules and tradition versus truth in the Holy Spirit. Like the top 
uh, the story told about this couple. This guy got married, and his wife was a great cook, and she was making a roast. And she was going to put it in the oven, and right before she put it in the oven, she, she chopped off both ends of it. He thought, oh, man, she chopped off the end of the roast. That's my favorite part. It's grisly, and it's greasy, and it's kind of crunchy, and I like it. She cooked it. He didn't say anything. A couple weeks later, she's cooking a ham, and she cuts off both ends of it and puts it in the oven. He thinks, what's up with cutting off the ends of the meat? So he asked her. He said, look, honey, you know, why do you do that? She goes, well, my mom always did it, so that's why I do it. Sooner or later, he, he was with his mother-in-law, and he said, hey, let me ask you a question. What's with cutting off the ends of the meat? She goes, I don't know. My mom always did it. <laughs> so pretty soon, he was with Granny. And he says, hey. What's up with cutting off the ends of the, the meat, the ham and the roast? She goes, well, when we first got married, I had a little small pan and it wouldn't fit in there. <laughs> so I had to cut the ends off. And that's kind of like some of our rules and traditions. We don't really know why we do it or say it or make people adhere to it, but, well, it's always been done that way. He says, be led by the Spirit, be led by love. Balance, self-control. Think about how much sense people's lists make. About how sometimes we, we go about life in Christ and where the Scripture is silent and we, we want to fill it in. You might be sitting here today and you might be thinking, well, John, wait a minute. How far do you go in limiting your freedom to not offend someone? Because, John, come on, some people are crazy. Some people are weird church people. And they won't let you do anything. They're narrow-minded. You know, the, the church has to be, uh, I think, like a hospital. It, it can't be so clean and pure and antiseptic that people can't have surgery done. Well, we don't want any blood around. We don't want anything messy. But at the same time, it can't be so messy and bloody that everybody gets infected by one another. There's a balance. It's like the Christian who came to someone who, who was, you know, joyful and laughing and said, well, nowhere in the Scripture do I ever see this ever recorded that Jesus laughed or smiled. So in order to be godly. I'm like, what? Are you nuts? You use discernment and wisdom and balance and, and self-control. But in verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of your freedom for food. All things are indeed pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with an offense. If they know this is going to stumble someone, oh, it may be perfectly okay. But if it's not for the weaker brother, then it's evil to do it. That's what he's saying. When my actions or freedom hinders God's work in someone else, I yield. That's what he says. I back off. I control my freedom for the sake of others. It's like the Apostle Paul. I mean, think of the Apostle Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a good Jewish boy, grew up with all the rules and regulations, kept the law to the T. And then one day on the road to Damascus, he's amazingly converted. And he realizes the difference between tradition and law versus love. Uh, uh, the difference between keeping rules and regulations and being led by the Spirit of Christ. He fought with the Judaizers. He, 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 he realized this thing of controlling his freedom. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. Let, let's just say he's sitting at a table in Rome with, with Jews and Gentiles. They're about to eat. And someone brings out a plate of big, fat, juicy ribeyes. Twice-baked potato with sour cream and chives. Grilled asparagus with butter just kind of bubbling on it. Some key lime pie. Paul asks a quick blessing, 
And he takes his knife and he cuts into that juicy steaks and he's about to eat it. And he hears one of the Gentiles say, hey, bro, dude, where'd you get this beef? Oh, man, there's a meat market down in the city that, that offers it to idols and they cut the price in half. I bought it there. Suddenly you hear forks drop and a few people cough. Apostle Paul has one on his fork, a little piece. And he looks around. He says, hey, can I get a to-go box for this steak? And bring me a few more potatoes and some asparagus. And because he limits his freedom for the sake of others. When my liberty hinders God's work, I yield. That's called maturity. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses the same situation. I want to read it to you. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew. He says, When I'm around those Jews who, who are concerned about the law, who are concerned about tradition and holy days and feasts and festivals, yeah, I, I become a Jew that I might win some Jews to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Hey, I, I become like them. And then he says this, to those who are without the law, I become as without the law. To those pagan crazy people, he says, I hang out with them. To the weak, I become as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Paul says, hey, I'm flexible. I'm not rigid. I, I, I try to live in a way that I can, you know, touch as many lives as I can, he says. Be careful of your criticisms, of your lists, or as one pastor friend of mine used to say, of your sin sniffing. <laughs> You know, oh, yeah. Lighten up. Be careful. Don't be so critical of others. You know, as a pastor, I have, have as much freedom as you do. And I'm pushing my cart sometimes to the grocery store, and I run into a church person, and, and it's almost without... Them, they're looking in my cart. <laughs> what if Pastor John's got any beer in there? Does he have anything in there that's bad? And so I usually have it all covered up with chips. And <laughs> you say, well, what do you got under there? Oh, you want, I'm not telling you. But this afternoon you'll be thinking, does he really have something under there? Be Be careful. You know, when, when we had grandkids start coming into our life, it's an interesting thing. We have 11 of them now. Nine of them live around here. And recently we had four of the girls. There's only four daughters, four granddaughters, and there's seven grandsons. Five of the grandsons live here, and two live in California. So Lynn hosted a, a, the four granddaughters over the other night for a sleepover. Well, basically, they manipulated us into it. We didn't, it wasn't our idea, but they came on social media and made an announcement like, we want to come to your house. And they, you know, so we're like, well, okay. And so we had them over. And we wanted to make it fun. We, we wanted to make it something for them. They're, they're just little, you know, 11 and under. So we had pizza. We have a... You know, we have a trampoline in our yard that Lynn and I rarely use. <laughs> Who bought it for them? We have a swimming pool. They're running back and forth from the pool. They had their pizza. They're running through the house. They're having a great time. And, and at the end of it all, and when it was getting later, Lynn had bought these special little dishes, and we had bought a couple of cartons of really good vanilla ice cream and chocolate syrup and whipped cream. And we're, you know, we got it all set out for all four, and we're putting the whipped cream on it. And their eyes are super big. And Lynn goes, oh, well, there's one more thing. We got some cherries. So I put a little beautiful little red cherry on top. 
And one of the little granddaughters stands up like a Greek orator with her finger in the air. And she goes, this will go down in history as one of the greatest sleepovers at grandma's house ever. <laughs> I'm just dying laughing. Was it crazy with them over there? Oh, yeah. Were they running through our house and grabbing and touching everything? Were their fingerprints all over the doors and, you know, toys all out in the yard? Yeah, it was all over there. But we put up with it because we love them. And, and that's the principle that Paul's talking about here. We, we're all different. We all have certain places and, you know, positions of maturity. You know, I can remember when the, the kids first started coming over to the house. The first granddaughter was born. And they bring her over, you know, Dad, here she is. You're like, wow, it's just a little blob. Yeah, look at her. Uh, yeah, see her. She's not doing much. And they slowly start to mature, just like us in our faith. You know, a big thing in, with, a, with a new baby is they finally get to the place where this dramatic thing happens. <laughs> and it's a huge when you're a parent, I guess, or I, I, I kind of remember, they, they roll over. <laughs> Look, they rolled over. And that, that, that's some, you know, some of us in our faith like, wow, look, they stopped doing that. Or they're doing that now. They never did that before. They got consistent with this or they started doing this. They rolled over. And then the biggest thing, I guess, when kids start getting a little bigger is they start walking on their own. And we can see that in Christians' lives sometimes. Well, they're reading the Bible on their own. They're sharing the gospel on their own. And you're just like, wow, this is awesome. It may be awkward. It may even be sometimes like wrong. Not very theologically sound. I mean, how about kids when they first start walking? Does it, is it really, you know, it's pretty awkward looking, right? You ever seen a little kid make their first few steps? They look like a little chimpanzee. You think, okay, this is awesome. They're doing it. And so, so this is kind of what, where we're at together in this walk. You know, some are mature, some are not so mature. I don't want to do anything. I, you know, I put all, everything away in the house when they were little so they wouldn't hurt themselves, they wouldn't fall. We got round tables, we got cushy things. We put stuff in the plug so they won't stick a fork in there. We do it all because we like doing it. No, because we love the kids and we don't want them to get hurt. We don't want to stumble them. It's the same in our faith. Paul gives some warnings as he closes out this passage of Scripture in chapter 14. I'm just going to read three verses and then we'll go back. It is good, verse 21, neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy, blessed is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Then the last one. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, and whatever is not from faith is, is sin. So verse 21, he says, it's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. I would say, he says, first of all, be considerate of other people. Oh, you, you might be free to do it, but don't do it in front of people who you'd stumble. You say, well, John, is it okay to do it at home? If it's okay with you. And if someone's looking through your window, that, they got a bigger problem than we, <laughs> than we want to talk about. R remember the context. Drunkenness is unclean. If, if I observe Halloween and I have a conviction not to, then, then it's unclean for me. Well, what about my neighbor? If they're uncomfortable with it and I want to celebrate it, well, wear a really nice costume so they don't know who you are. In verse 22, he says, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. In other words, he's saying, do you have some convictions? Blesses he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Whatever works for you, know that it's right. Know that it's godly. That it's not offending others. 
You'll never live up to everyone's standards, but don't stumble them. And the things you do approve and the things that you do embrace, be convinced in your own mind. That, that's the next word, be convinced. Be considerate, be convinced. And then verse 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith or whatever is not from faith is sin. Be Be consistent. Don't do it just to fit in. I remember there was a thing going through, and I don't know if it was just Calvary Chapel pastors or not, but it was a weird thing to me. You know, I, 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 um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have parents who read me the Bible. They didn't take me to church. I was a high school dropout at 16. I moved and lived in a surf shop in Delaware for summers, and I didn't have a lot of parental oversight. So I started smoking cigarettes when I was about 13, and when I got saved, everything changed. And a couple of things, as I matured, I laid down and told the Lord, I'll never do that again. One of them was smoking. Not, not that I, I don't think smoking will send you to hell. You know the old story. It just makes you smell like you've been there, but <laughs> it won't send you there. So I, I laid down the smoking thing, said, Lord, that's something I'm convicted of. I know it's not good for me. I'm not going to do it. So there's this thing that was going through the pastors in Calvary Chapel. I don't know where it came from. It just kind of started, and people felt the freedom and the license to do it. And I was with a group of guys somewhere, and, and someone uh, whipped out a, a bunch of um, cigars. They got some Cubans. I said, really? And they're all kind of looking at them and licking them and cutting the ends off of them and lighting them up. And the guy wanted to give me one, and I said, nah, I'm good. They what you... you what, you think it's a sin? I go, well, it kind of is for me. I, I have to have my own convictions about certain things. That was for me. It wasn't for them, and I was fine with them smoking a cigar. But it just wasn't for me. And I, I think you've got to know yourself and your convictions and, and your past and what the promises you've made and the things you've come out of. I mean, when I got saved, I, I was a, a new convert for about a year. When I enrolled in Bible college and moved to Lakeland, Florida, and, and think about this, I had lived my whole life on the Gulf Coast and East Coast and traveled around surfing, and suddenly I'm at a very, very conservative, ultra-conservative Bible college. Now this is, uh, uh, we go way back in the annals of time to 1973 and four. Yeah, I know. It's insane. <laughs> <There's, laughs> the earth was still frozen over and dinosaurs. So I'm in Bible college, and they had all these rules. I'm not sure they were biblical, but they had a lot of rules. One was, and this is like right near Orlando, Florida. This is central Florida, and you could not wear shorts on campus. You couldn't wear shorts. That's practically all I owned was shorts and T-shirts. And so I think, wow, you can't wear a short. Because looking at the leg, and, and I can see my legs would make some women stumble, but, you know, <laughs> I understood, understood that. So I limited my freedom. You couldn't hold hands with a girl on campus. That was taboo. If they saw you doing that, they'd write you up and you'd lose, quote, honor points. Honor points, you lose a certain amount of honor points, you can get suspended. So you couldn't do that. You couldn't sit in a certain proximity near a woman. Lynn and I started dating and there's a lake in front of the, 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 the campus and we were sitting down there, not, not touching, but we were sitting too close and we got written up for sitting too close to one another. I told Lynn not to sit that close to me. You can't sit that close to me. <laughs> They had another rule that really I couldn't understand. I couldn't get my head around as I'm reading through the rules. One was said, no mixed bathing. I thought, who would bathe with another opposite sex anyway? I mean, I, I never even did that when I wasn't a Christian. And I found out that meant you couldn't swim with a woman in the Gulf or in a swimming pool. You had to be in by 11 p.m., you couldn't go to a movie theater. No movies. They're sinful. 
couldn't have a TV in your dorm. I mean, after the first month, I almost left. But I realized God had called me there for a very specific purpose. It wasn't about all those rules and regulations. It was about my heart to follow the Lord and be where he called me to be. See, in all things, he says, love. That's the overarching principle in this passage of Scripture. It's hard to drive people away if you love them. It's easy to drive them away if you criticize them. And one thing I want you to know as a church, this is a church. You can come here with a coat and tie. (laughs) Nobody does. Or you can come here in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. We still love you. You're accepted. You can come here with tattoos and piercings or without them. You're still loved. You can walk here if, you're, if you can't afford a car and, 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 you know, walk up here and come to church or you can drive a brand new Porsche. Amen? Now, here's one where we probably won't get an amen. You can be a Republican or a Democrat and come here to church. <laughs> this is a church, not a political rally. You can read the NIV or the New Living Translation. You can go to movies. Contrary to what my son said first service last Sunday, you can be an LSU fan or an Alabama fan, and we still love you. It doesn't matter. This is a church. You're welcome here. It doesn't matter if you walk like a chimpanzee or, or you know the Bible backwards and forwards and you've conformed to it in your own life. It's about loving one another. We're all diverse. We're all different. But we all need acceptance and love, and we all need to give each other space to grow and mature. And we pray that we grow up in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we sung earlier, and I don't pick out the songs, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They'll know we are Christians by our love. That's what Jesus said. He said, by by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you're Republican. That's not what he said. That you're an American. Nah, there was no America. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciple, that you have love for one another. The most powerful thing that demonstrates the heart of God I mean, if you could take the Bible and nature and sermons and every way you can think of that God speaks, I think the overarching message that would come forth is that God would be saying, I love you. That's what he says. From the beginning to the end, I love you. And this is the way they'll know that you're mine, that you also love one another. So Paul in Romans chapter 14 is saying, love doesn't stumble each other. Love doesn't say, well, I have a right to in me and my, and, you know, I'm going to live this way. I don't care what they think. They're immature. No, he says, no, love yields. Love puts on the brakes. Love recognizes that I'm called not to stumble someone. And so Paul wants to remind us, it doesn't matter how weak or how strong you might be, the major principle is love. And as you grow closer and closer to Christ and you learn of him, you find out, man, that's how he treats me. Aren't you so grateful when you come to the Lord, he doesn't just start criticizing you about everything. He says, hey, come to me, those who are weary. And that's the context of that verse. Those who have been under the law, those who have been under the rules, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, come unto me. I'll give you rest because I'll give you love. You know, what attracted me to Jesus was not the church I went to. The church I went to when I first got saved, boy, they had some rules. Our hair was too long. 
my hair was long. We, we wore, you know, shorts, and uh, we, we were surfers. And, and I remember when a guy, a part of our group, there's about 40 of us starting to go to church together. One of our friends wanted to join the church. You know what they told him? You can't join this church. We're like, what? What do you mean we can't join this church? No, your hair is too long. So you can't join a church if your hair is long? No, get a haircut. So we're out there in the foyer and, you know, looking at the picture of Jesus with long hair. We go, <laughs> Jesus couldn't join this church. And many of, them, many of my friends didn't come back to that church after that. It wasn't the church and the rules. What, what brought me there was the love of God and the desire to know him. And boy, I tell you, rules, regulations, and sin sniffing and criticizing will drive people far away from Christ. You read the story of Jesus. He, now I'm not saying he compromised, but he loved people. When they throw the woman down in front of him, caught in adultery, and Jesus says, well, th those of you who have no sin, go ahead and start stoning her. They all left. Neither do I condemn you, he says. Go, but stop sinning. Stop that lifestyle. He expressed great love for those who needed it, and he continues to do that. And Paul's kind of principle here is, let us do the same. We're all part of the body of Christ. Thank you.